What is going on, guys? Welcome back. Comments here for you. Jimmy Smith, Ryan Moody, our MMA show. We just had the longest pre-show chat ever, so I don't know how it's going to impact the show. But, you know, we have to start this show off with a couple bits of news. And probably the first thing that you guys already know, but we've yet to address it, is the passing of Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and various other friends and family that were on a helicopter over the course of the weekend. Uh, this is beyond tragic. Uh, obviously, something that impacts the life of everyone outside of the world of sports. Obviously, most of you know that Kobe was from the area I live. So naturally, his influence in terms of high school athletics was so powerful here. And obviously, something where you can have someone pass away, but you also can know that their legacy will never, ever be met. And it's interesting. One of the things me and Jimmy were talking about is and as I reflected on this, I couldn't think of one person from the entire realm of MMA that I would put in the same light as Kobe Bryant. And that's not to diminish anything that anyone in our sport has achieved or done as an athlete or a person. But I think it just speaks to the caliber of person that Kobe Bryant was. And certainly the world is going to be a far less bright place without him in it. And hopefully, obviously, Jimmy and I can both say... Anyone touched by this, which is probably a lot of you, you know, can work through this. His family can find some type of peace and comfort. Uh, and naturally, I think as we go forward, it's going to be refreshing to see just about every sports organization and countless athletes pay tribute to him in their own special ways. And I think that's something that at least I'm looking forward to. A little bit of trying to get back to normalcy you know, as we see how everyone plans their own personal tributes to show how much he meant to them. The show I did Monday for Sirius XM, I'm, I'm filling in for Luke Thomas all week, was the most emotional show I have ever done in my whole life. And um, a lot of people calling in talking about Kobe and personal tragedy and all these things, and it's tough. And, you know, I, I, I'm, i you know, he grew up near you and he played in my hometown, Los Angeles, California. And uh, what he meant to Southern California basketball and athletics, and uh, it's one of the few instances where we as Lakers fans saw him grow up, got signed out of high school and became a man while playing for the Lakers, stayed with one team his entire career. And so you feel like you know him because you saw him so often and develop into a man. And, you know, the stuff I've heard from fans and, and once again, dealing with it on the show is incredibly emotional, but um, he would have wanted people to go on and compete and, and, live life, I think. And, and you mourn and then you go back to doing what you need to do. And when you talk about his intensity, that was kind of unmatched and whether it's MMA or whatever sport you love and you're into, there's a natural aptitude for it. There's talent. And then there's single-minded competitive obsession. And he had that in spades. And I think that's what made him special to watch, but he'll be missed for sure. Yeah, and naturally, you also kind of touched on it there, the impact that he had, not only where you're from, but where I'm from, there are going to be, you know, decades of athletes that grow up. There, there's going to be people that never see Kobe Bryant play live, like we've had the opportunity, thankfully, to do, but his influence will forever touch basketball. I think it's incredible, and you try to put in perspective, I know some people will say it was, you know, clouded by emotion, but there was a very large push to get his likeness replacing the current NBA logo in terms of the silhouette. I can't think of one athlete in any other sport where that would even come into consideration other than this. Yeah, I think that's it for sure. And the way he died and the untimely nature of his death. And this guy was not a, not an athlete that we thought would you know, no substance abuse issues, no health issues. This was such an incredible surprise and a tragedy. And all those things together have an impact that I think is felt by every sports fan. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where I initially saw it. And I saw it and I didn't believe it. I, I literally thought, and, and hopefully, you know, to start the transition back to MMA, somebody had posted a comment on, you know, one of my media outlets that said, you know, rest in peace, Kobe. This was almost instantaneous to when it happened. 
So I initially go back, and I'm sure you've seen this. There's instances in chat rooms and, and things with MMA where, where people constantly put rest in peace Joe Rogan. Like, it's a it's a huge running thing that you put rest in peace Joe Rogan. And I thought to myself initially, how did we transfer this over to Kobe Bryant? Like, why would he be brought into this sick, you know, joke that people have? And obviously all it took was about two seconds of Google and a quarter second yeah. of Twitter to realize that it wasn't indeed any type of joke and unfortunately he'd passed but it's ironic that that's one of the first things are you aware of that are you aware of the people in the fanscape do that rest in peace joe rogan thing yeah it's weird i've seen it and it's just it's just strange to me you know yeah it's but, it's definitely yeah. it's definitely not funny anymore i guess would be yeah you know the best way to portray it so I guess the other thing that we need to talk about, and it's a tough transition from that, obviously, but we have surpassed our own milestone in terms of the podcast. I know a lot of you guys listen to this on YouTube, and for those of you that don't realize, we literally just port the audio uh, from the podcast over to YouTube. That's why there's no visuals that go with this, uh, but we surpassed 100,000 downloads for, I guess, as long as we've been doing this which I probably should have been more prepared to know the exact date. It's been less than a year, for sure. So whether you're listening to it there, or you're listening to it, well, let me just say, if you're listening to it here, if you can hear us, then we definitely appreciate the support you've given us, far exceeded whatever expectations, which were very small, that we had. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're going to take this in stride and, you know, use this as motivation to push forward. And hopefully, you know, we can see 200,000, 300,000, and then obviously, you know, the the big million seems to be like the next big landmark there, right, Jimmy? I think it is, and that's a huge milestone, and I don't know what to say other than thank you to everybody who's who's listened and downloaded and supported and commented, and it's meant a lot to both of us. Yes, I, I can absolutely yeah. agree. Those of you that tolerate me to hear Jimmy, I, I appreciate you. <laughs> so, eight-minute mark, because we get people now that, really demand timestamps. We're we're going to start to talk about, and, you know, it, it's funny, you kind of have to go back, you know, when when is it okay to laugh again, right? When is it okay to joke about things again? Uh, and I know that, you know, it's kind of one of those things that as time passes, we'll probably be a bit more passive to these things. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, some comments, Ioana and Jacek made, uh, actually just originally an image that she put up of herself, Wheelie Zhang, uh, and she was wearing a gas mask in the poster, which is obviously... Uh, indicative of the horrific issue right now that China has with the coronavirus. And I understand that there are people that may find comedic value in that. However, I don't know that now is the time or place. And the other argument with this, Jimmy, is, and I looked at some polls on this today, it seems like no one can ever take things at face value anymore. It seems like we just can't look at something anymore and justify, hey, that's that's probably the wrong thing to do. That's probably the wrong thing to say probably the wrong imagery to use everything has to be you're either a snowflake that can't handle anything or this is the worst thing that ever happened the worst thing that anybody could ever do and i think a lot of things fall in between and ultimately end in poor judgment i just don't understand what the value you on a saw in this was yeah that was a thing to me it was in poor taste you know, is is maybe the the best way to put it. And what got me about it is there are two levels of trash talk to me, generally speaking. One of them is I'm gonna kick their ass, I'm better, whatever. How you know the the the, the garden variety, they suck, I'm gonna beat them up, trash talk. And then there's trash talk that's intensely personal. Like Colby Covington talking about Kamaru Usman's coach dying of a heart attack and Matt Hughes getting hit by a train where it's, it's really specific and personal and malicious. And I thought this was like, it, it kind of missed both of them because it shows her, if you haven't seen it, it shows her standing behind Weili Zhang and she has like an antivirus mask on essentially an air pur purifier kind of gas mask on. There's no indication, I haven't heard anything, that Weili Zhang's family has been affected by this virus and be close to her has been infected by this virus. I don't know that, but I haven't heard anything about it. So it doesn't necessarily attack her personally and specifically. 
it doesn't. It's not even you know, Colby Covington's Brazilians are filthy animals. It's kind of a, a a knock on the country itself, but it wasn't that explicit. And Wei Li Zhang isn't doesn't seem like the kind of person to get affected by trash talk. So it's almost like it was kind of in the middle where it was you know in poor taste about a virus that's actually hurting and killing people, but it didn't specifically target Wei Li Zhang, and. It didn't seem to give Yuan and Jichik a psychological edge over Wei Li Zhang if that's what she was looking for. So it was just useless. Like you're spending this currency. A lot of fans went like, hey, screw her. I'm not her fan anymore, whatever. I'm hoping she gets her ass kicked, whatever. So she lost some fans over it, and I don't think it did anything for her. So it just seemed like a really strange choice. As you said, it's kind of in the middle. It's not the most offensive thing I've ever seen, but it was over the line and in poor taste in my opinion. But it didn't – she didn't get anything out of it. So practically as a tool to get an advantage over your opponent, I thought it was a total miss. Right, and we've seen a lot of examples of things you've talked about. We, we've seen the, the cringe of Henry Cejudo, right, where he throws the snake at TJ Dillashaw. And we get it. it. It's awful. It's silly. It's it's banter to a degree. And then we've also seen, you know, like you talked about, the, the deeply personal stuff, you know, bringing up mad use, you know, things you just you, – you, you hear it. And even as a fan, it's hard for you to back that. Like, if, if you're the biggest Yuana fan, it's hard for you to to sign off on this and say, yeah, go get her. Like, that's that's right. You know, it just seems like something so unnecessary, right? Like, you could really pick some better things to actually point out if you wanted to do that. However, the other side of this is she's just, in my opinion, starting to rebuild her image. I mean, this is a, a girl that came in, all the confidence in the world, was checking a lot of boxes, was doing a lot of things we want from an athlete, dominating, telling you she was going to dominate, telling you how she was going to dominate. That's what we want. But then we started to see the issues. You know, the overconfidence almost seemed to get to her. And then now, you know, you kind of start to have people looking past that. She's got back on the winning track, and it seems like all she needed to do was just sit there passively go through, okay, you know, maybe you want to show your confidence, great. But this wasn't really her showing her confidence. This really wasn't her talking about her skill. This was literally her just putting up imagery that doesn't really have a lot of context of fighting. Yeah, and that's always what she's been great at. She does the weigh-in thing where she really gets in your face and known for her intensity and you're going to fail and all this stuff and yelling. but. As far as the below the belt trash talk, that's never been her M.O. And what bothered me a little bit, even more than what she did, was her half apology was, hey, I was just retweeting something I thought was funny. And no, you weren't. I mean, come on, just just own it and apologize. All right. That was in poor taste. That was too far. My fault. She didn't make this thing. Apparently, she retweeted it or put it on her uh, Instagram story. You know, somebody else's. But it, it just own it and apologize. Not this got misconstrued, which is absolutely ridiculous. It did not. And, you know, either own it and apologize or own it and don't apologize. But the half apology was a little a, a little weird. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, the other thing you mentioned, some character with her, I thought it was very odd and out of place for her to question someone else's nationality in that, that type of way. Someone, you know, she is fiercely loyal to her fans and her country. She loves, you know, where she comes from and respects that. So to see her kind of turn that back on someone else, I, I thought was just something we, like you said, we've kind of never seen from her. Yeah, I mean, and also it's a bad look. In terms of, I say this all the time about MMA, uh, change isn't good if you're winning. So when someone comes out and does something kind of out of character, especially coming off uh, a, a dominant performance where she looked good, she looked sharp, it uh, clearly put her in title contention, it, it makes you wonder about, oh, is her confidence all there? Is she looking for a little edge? Is she doubting herself? Is this some da, da, da? Now, none of that might be true. But you still think it and wonder about it because, as we've said, this isn't normal for her. So fans might be a little like, I oh, mean, does she think she needs a little bit of a boost? Is she worried about herself? Is that is she looking for a psychological edge? And, you know, so it so it brings to mind some questions that you don't want swirling around before a fight this big. 
You know, and it, it's interesting you put it that way, because I thought the response that Zhang had was absolutely perfectly worded to that. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll go ahead and read it to you now. Uh, it says, to make fun of tragedy is a true sign of one's character. People are dying. Someone's father, someone's mother, someone's child. Say what you want about me if it makes you feel stronger, but do not joke about what's happening here. I wish you good health until March 7th. I will see you soon. That is literally the most, I'm going to write off your childishness. I'm going to turn it back on you as my strength. And then I'm going to wish you the best until we actually fight. I, you, you could have had her take this so many different ways. And she literally took the least emotional route that you could have. It almost just shouts back to her, like, whatever you thought you were going to do with this, none of it happened. Spot on. Spot on. She just nailed it. And I really liked her response. Because it, as you said, kind of put Yuana and Jacek's offense on defense. If it was supposed to rile Wei Li Zhang up, it, it didn't work. It was supposed to throw her off her game. Didn't happen. Supposed to get her upset. That wasn't going to happen either. She just perfectly and succinctly called her out as, as immature and I'm more prepared than you are. Now, whether or not that's true, that's the light she's casting it in. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was a perfectly worded response. Yeah, I mean, if these are social media teams at play, and I, I really don't think that they are. I think a lot of times in MMA, I, I know there's a social media teams that interject, but for the most part, in, in my issues with this, the fighter has, number one, the majority say, and number two, the, the fighter is always aware of what's going on. So for, obviously, like you said, you want it to just say, well, hey, I retweeted this. The fact of the matter is, whoever you got it from, no one knew. So the first time a lot of us saw it was on your feed, so you have to kind of take ownership of it. And as you said, it, it puts her in that, you know, pulls her right back down to that, hey, you know, you are not the big draw here like you've been before. You have to actually do something to make yourself seem bigger, because you're not. And this is the fight we've talked about for quite some time, and I think we're both on the same side that I don't think Ioana was going to come into this with all the chances and opportunities to win. She probably needed a little bit of an edge mentally. If this was her way of going about it, this is the worst start to this you could have. Perception, pre-fight, is reality. you got to remember that. When it comes to the fans, perception is reality. We have to believe you're going to have a shot. We're going to have to believe that you're at the top of your game. Because you're asking us to spend money on a pay-per-view we can't return, right? You're asking us to maybe bet money if we're in Vegas or something like that uh, on your abilities to perform and succeed. We need faith beforehand. Unlike other products that you can return, you can't when it comes to fighting. And this one isn't on free TV like football or basketball. No playoff system, anything like that. So fighting is about kind of building up credit or momentum right beforehand to get fans to believe in you this was a step in the wrong direction if you're a Yoani and Jacek fan and I saw more than once people posting this and going I'm not a fan of Yoani and Jacek anymore I don't support her anymore that's the last thing you need heading into a fight like this biggest fight of her career I would agree, but I would also say I, I think a lot of that probably will pass. You know, time time does heal all wounds to a degree, and if they truly were a fan, you know, they'll probably look to move past this rather quickly, maybe maybe quicker than they should to that point. Uh, but as you said, if you're Joanna... But quicker you're... than the fight. That, that, that That's my question, is if she wins, sure, all these people are going to jump right back on the bandwagon. But if she loses, especially in dominant fashion to Wei Li Zhang, it's easy to say, I told you so. People tend to pile it on in situations like that. And if she loses to Wei Li Zhang, once again, especially in dominant fashion, a lot of people will go, yeah, see, that's why I'm not a fan. It's easy to then pile it on. You don't want to put yourself in that position. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, certainly, yeah. if, if she were to lose this fight, people would continue to push that negativity to the point where, like you said, you know, she may not have a whole lot of other options in terms of being credible. 
I mean, this isn't certainly going to be something that impacts her entering this fight as far as they're not going to pull her off the card. They're probably not going to use this in any promotion. I'm sure the UFC wants to distance themselves from this as much as possible. But from a fan's perspective, as you said, listen, they're fiercely loyal and they're also very, I guess, unapologetic in their stance. If she loses this fight, there are going to be more people than you can imagine that will be willing to sit there and say, yeah, exactly right. That's what you deserve. Maybe you shouldn't have made fun of Wheelie Zhang and the coronavirus. So you kind of got what you expected the second time. This wouldn't be the first time she's had something like this backfire. Obviously, you know, Rose, you know, citing the God's prayer to her while she, you know, basically put her hand in her fist on stage. A lot of people just rallied behind that and said, hey, this is great. You know, she lost and she got what was coming to her. Well, you're kind of putting yourself right back in that position, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing is, is that this is a situation where as a former champion, had some losses, of course, uh, to Thug Rose and then, of course, to uh, Shevchenko. It's you, you want the sympathy. Not sympathy, but like the comeback trail. Can the old champ do it? Can she show what she used to show and all these things? You kind of want that Rocky vibe. You want that underdog vibe. Well, you can't play that as the heel. You got to kind of be the face. And I was around Tito Ortiz when he was in his prime. I was training at Team Punishment. And then I saw him, you know, go on his slide and, and, when he wasn't quite the the dominant fighter he once was, and what happened? He he went from the Huntington Beach bad boy to the People's Champion, right? He tried not not successfully to everybody, but he did kind of a face turn, right? You realize when you start losing, you're not a dominant force anymore. People don't want to hear that stuff. People don't want to hear how great you are and all this stuff, and you're going to do this, this, and that. I remember when he lost to Chuck Liddell, and he was doing what he always did, doing the Tito talk, and people were booing. They didn't want to hear it. And you want to get Jacek has to recognize that. You want to eat some humble pie and be the underdog and be the, the old grizzled champion people want to see win. She needs people rooting for her at this stage in her career. Yeah, no, I would agree completely. And that's why I think it's so difficult to see somebody that was for a very long time, you know, very beloved, very well respected and thought about kind of continue to do things that, you know, if we look back in history, it taints people's legacy to do things like this. There will be people that remember this far more than they remember who she fought on her fourth UFC fight. Exactly. This is the second chapter of her career. Champion, dominant champion, knocked off the horse, trying to get back on the horse. It's pivotal right now. It's pivotal. You want everything lined up in your way. And I thought Wei Li Zhang would be champion. And I think she's going to hold it for a while. Even though this is the best division in women's MMA, I really think Wei Li Zhang is special. Yuana Jiji is going to need a lot to dethrone her. She's going to need a near perfect fight. You don't need any distractions. For anyone listening at the 23-second mark that heard her fourth fight and knew that was Jessica Penny and thought, we were going to divulge into that topic. You are wrong, my friend. <laughs> but you probably know way too much about MMA if you knew immediately what you were thinking and obviously what you expected us to project. So with that said, we are going to take a rather quick exit. Appreciate you guys listening to this, and we will be back very shortly with more commentary. 